Mercy alludes to overlooking someone else's weakness or their flaws. And you don't deal with them because of their shortcomings. That is mercy. It's not because of any sin or that deserves punishment, but you just know this is a weakness and you choose not to react. That is mercy. Mercy and favor reflect each other. They're like twins and grace is the parent. So the all-encompassing grace of God has mercy in it. Mercy is a dimension of God's grace. When Amen. God decides to have compassion and show mercy to someone who has wronged us, if anything, it should cause us to rejoice. You know why? Because your enemy is not consumed. Psalm 23, 5 says, He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. If your enemies are wrecked and consumed, how will they see what God is doing in your life? We're going to look at Psalm 90, verses 1 to 14, and we're all going to read together. One, two, three, go. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man to destruction and say, Return, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night, you carry them away like a flood. They are like a sleep. In the morning, they are like grass which grows up. 
In the morning, it flourishes and grows up. In the evening, it is cut down and withers, for we have been consumed, and by your wrath we are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance, for all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long, and have compassion on your servants. O satisfy us early with your mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. So I've titled this message, That We May Rejoice Always. This particular psalm in our Bibles, we'll see that it is referred to as uh, the, the prayer of Moses. It's actually one of the few psalms that was not written by David. And it describes a prayer Moses, the man of God, said to God. It is about the mortality of man. The history of this psalm in a nutshell, it's based on Moses' experience. This was his reality. God had appointed him to lead the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. And they were delivered by the power and leadership, by the power of God through the leadership of Moses. But he encountered so many challenges with the children of Israel while they were en route. They murmured and grumbled so much that even after they crossed the Red Sea and they had seen the mighty power of God, they were still not happy. They were murmuring. And they ended up in the wilderness homeless because of their unbelief. And it, as if it wasn't bad enough, then Moses went to the mountaintop to receive instructions from God, to receive the commandments. And they chose themselves to, to worship this golden calf image that they had made. And this further sin broke the relationship between Israel and God that he said they will not enter the promised land. This was Moses' reality. This is what was going on and this is his experience. So he had to go to God in prayers because he recognized that their behavior was a major de deterrent and they would not enter the promised land. So verse 1, he began with a declaration and up to verse 12, talking about the futility of man in the light of God's supremacy. And then it culminated in verses 13 and 14. His prayer began there. But today we're just going to look at verses 13 and 14. And um, we may also identify with Moses with present day, the futility of mankind, what we've been through, this pandemic, we can see that man is just man and God is God. Amen. So, Psalm 90, verse 13 and 14. It's very clear. One thing that Moses recognized, that there's a correlation between mercy and rejoicing. He understood that mercy is a, ghetto, a gateway to rejoicing. If you notice in verse um, 14, he says, Oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. There's a correlation between mercy and rejoicing. He recognized that they couldn't worship God in that state of bondage with this golden image that they had created and that they had to have liberty and they could only get liberty from the mercy of God. Amen. For all their sins that had displeased God, they needed God's mercy. But how then can we explain mercy? Because mercy is a lot of things. It is a lot of things. It is usually said to be compassion or kindness shown to someone that deserves to be punished. But mercy doesn't stop there. If we break it down, it's more than that. It's a lot of things. Mercy alludes to overlooking someone else's weakness or their flaws 
and you don't deal with them because of their shortcomings, that is mercy. It's not because of any sin or that deserves punishment, but you just know this is a weakness and you choose not to react. That is mercy. Mercy can also transfer to favor. It's not because you're deserving of any punishment, but in an instant, somebody sees your need and they don't look at the things that could make them not advance, you know, support. They just look at you and they have favor. That is mercy. Mercy and favor reflect each other. They're like twins and grace is the parent. So the all-encompassing grace of God has mercy in it. Mercy is a dimension of God's grace. Amen. And sometimes we just seek God's favor. We seek his mercy. But sometimes we don't. He just advances it to us. Amen. And there are different instances in the Bible. We'll just look at a few. Because of our time. We'll take a few. Let's look at the story of blind Bartimaeus. In Mark 10. 46 to 52. We'll just consider one or two examples from the Bible. Blind Bartimaeus, Mark 10, 46 to 52. Let's follow me as I read. Now they came to Jericho. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. He cried out to the Lord Jesus for mercy that he may receive his sight. And Jesus showed mercy. What do you think would have come out of that? Rejoicing. Mercy, rejoicing. You ask for mercy, you receive, and you even receive more than you ask. It will cause you to rejoice. Let's look at another story. A man healed at the pool of Bethsaida. That's in John 5, 1 to 8. We're just looking at how mercy and rejoicing can relate. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethsaida, Bethesda, sorry, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool, and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water, was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there, who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? That is Jesus having compassion. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. Without a doubt, rejoicing. That would have caused him to rejoice. Verse 6 of that John 5 says, When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, 
Do you want to be made well? He didn't ask Jesus to show mercy. It was Jesus that showed mercy. It was just outright. Jesus was just moved and showed him mercy. That is favor. Amen. This is when mercy and favor coincide. In verses 7 to 8, the man said, I have no man to put me into the pool. That's not the answer to the question. What Jesus said is, do you want to be made well? You see, mercy is overlooking weaknesses and flaws. Jesus overlooked the fact that he didn't answer the question. He was still in the state of moaning. I don't have anyone to help me. Jesus overlooked that. Unlike blind Bartimaeus, that they said, please keep quiet, don't make noise. And he continued shouting. This man couldn't even ask. But Jesus overlooked his flaws and went outright to help him. I'm sure there was great rejoicing. A third example, we don't have to open to this. This one is even different from the other two. A woman of Canaan. Some versions refer to her as the Syrophoenician woman. Now, sometimes we go out around with a sense of entitlement. I'm a child of God, therefore I'm entitled to his mercy. But Jesus demonstrated here that sometimes it's not about what you're entitled to. This woman was not a Jew. She was not entitled to receive healing because the Jews first. But Jesus didn't focus on that. Actually, we'll read it. Matthew 15, 21 to 28. Matthew 15, 21 to 28. It says, Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs, and she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to him, O woman, great is your fate. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour, again rejoicing. She cried out to the Lord for mercy to effect a change over her daughter and her condition. By Jewish custom, she was not entitled, but again, Jesus was moved with compassion and showed mercy, favor. This means we sometimes have to bend over just a little bit to accommodate others, show them kindness, even when in our understanding they're not deserving. This is what God tells us in Luke 6, 36. Be merciful, even as your father is merciful so that we can also be an instrument of help to others to rejoice. Now, the bottom line with this is, when we lift up our voice in worship, in liberty and rejoicing, we don't relate it to mercy, but it is the mercy of God that has made it doable. So when our, our, our scripture for this month says, rejoice in the Lord always, again I say rejoice, it is doable to rejoice always when we understand God's mercy in its fullness. When we think that God's mercy is only when dire situations uh, we're faced with it and then we ask God for his assistance, we're limiting mercy. Mercy is beyond that. It's not just when we have challenges. Our scripture that says rejoice always is talking about everything. We must consider mercy in all its ramifications, not just isolated situations. We must recognize mercy at any given opportunity. We don't have to study a thesis before we recognize and identify that God's mercy is everywhere 24 seven. 
And should we feel that, okay, it's not so easy to achieve, then at least we can rejoice with those who rejoice. That is even another reason to rejoice. Amen. So in other words, mercy of God is all around us. All around us. There's so many scriptures we're familiar with that tell us that the mercy of God is everywhere. We only need to open our eyes to see it. Lamentations 3.22 says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. There's plenty of God's mercy to see, to make us rejoice. Luke 1.50 also says, And in his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. So God's mercy is just not in the now. We can even look back to begin to rejoice when we think of what God has done in the past from generation to generation. We can rejoice for what he did for our grandfather that we are still enjoying today. Generation to generation. Amen. The Lord is good to all. Psalm 145, 9. And his tender mercies are over all his works. So even his works, we can see mercy in his works. And if we look at his works and we see mercy, we can rejoice. I see my sister. She's so beautiful. And you know how we say, oh, God must have spent over time on this lady. That is a cause to rejoice. Just seeing somebody beautiful walking past you is a cause to rejoice. Amen. The mercy of God is not a scarce thing that we have to, we can see it everywhere. He goes on to say in Romans 9.15, he says to Moses, I have mercy on whomever I will have mercy on. And I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion on. This is where some of us have a challenge. We just think some people are not deserving. But that is God's sovereignty. Especially when they are, in quotes, our enemies. When God decides to have compassion and show mercy to someone who has wronged us. If anything, it should cause us to rejoice. You know why? Because your enemy is not consumed. Psalm 23, 5 says, He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. If your enemies are wrecked and consumed, how will they see what God is doing in your life? Again, rejoice for your enemy. It's a cause to rejoice. Amen. So we see that mercy is a dimension of God's grace. It's not something that we have to start searching for with a torchlight. Let's bring it to present day. There's a song in my native um, tongue. Um, the other day, my family and I were trying to translate it to English. And we did a fantastic job. Then we tried to sing it. It did not flow. <laughs> it did not flow. <laughs> I know some people can identify with that, you know. It was easy to translate because if I tell you the words, it's very easy. It says, I thank you, Lord, that I obtained mercy. I thank you, Lord, that I obtained mercy because it is not everyone that obtains mercy. But then we couldn't translate it. But there we go. But I listened to the testimony from that song and it just lifted my spirit song, as short as it is, the chorus was composed by a guy who had been in a terrible motor accident. The details are gory. I won't make it too graphic, but it was bad. And both his legs were trapped for three days. But he was rescued and he survived. And he ended in hospital. But it left his two feet twisted back to front yet in the midst of his pain he composed that song because he understood mercy he identified mercy in the fact that even though his legs were now deformed his voice wasn't he understood mercy that God still kept him alive for the glory of his name so situations like that tell me that we can rejoice always it's not a hard scripture. When we look at what God has done for other people, not even for us, we can rejoice. Amen. It takes God to save a man. Salvation in itself is an act of mercy from God. 
It takes only God to rescue us from a past that was not edifying and give us life, life abundant. Not just now, but even in the hereafter. Our being alive and healthy is by God's salvation. God is our keeper. He's our savior. There is joy in heaven when one person gets saved. So why not here that we are saved? Even if that is the only thing. Every day we wake up and to think, I'm saved. It's a cause to rejoice. We can rejoice always. Amen. Dear friend, I'd like to invite you to start a new relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ today if you have never done so. By A, acknowledge that you're a sinner. B, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sin. And C, confess him with your mouth as your personal Lord and Savior. So say this after me. Dear God, I come to you today just as I am. A sinner in need of a Savior. I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. And I believe in my heart that he died for my sin. And on the third day, God raised him up from the dead. Therefore, I am saved. You know, as simple as this prayer may sound, if you pray it from your heart, God heard you. And guess what? You are saved. You are now a child of God. So I encourage you, to find a good Bible-believing church wherein you can grow in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if there's any way I could be of help to you, please contact the number on the screen. I'll be more than happy to support you and to help you. Until next time when I come into your house, you keep on winning because God is on your side and you are destined to win. God bless you.